slides I'd like to share with you guys just to kind of give you an overview of the Cotton Research and Promotion Program for those of you that might not be familiar with who we are and what we do. Um, so we are um, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. Like I mentioned, I work for the Cotton Board. So we're the group that really administers the program. We collect assessments. We have that fiscal responsibility of the RMP program. And then we get to communicate back with stakeholders like we're doing today, what the program is doing on their behalf. We contract with a group um, called Cotton Incorporated. That's the arm that actually carries out the research and the promotion of cotton products to consumers. Um, they're really the arm that we utilize to create the demand, the profitability. Um, they're in touch with uh, consumer trends, consumer needs, a great team in ag and research development and product implementation to actually kind of um, carry out that research on keeping cotton profitable and also something that um, mills and merchants are interested in using cotton in their products. We do have USDA oversight. So the program is governed by the USDA. Um, they're the ones that kind of monitor some of our communication efforts, um, kind of tell us some things that we can and can't do. Um, it's because of this arm that we participate in no policy work, lobbying or legislation. We have great organizations in the cotton industry that take care of those um, areas for us. So we get a focus specifically on research and promotion here in the program. And I think that's something that's really exciting. Um, the Cotton Board headquarters are in Memphis, Tennessee, but we have regional staff based all across the US. You heard from us this morning um, that are kind of that arm directly to you guys as producers and stakeholders in the program. Cotton Incorporated's headquarters are in North Carolina, but they have uh, world offices in Japan, Mexico City, the consumer marketing offices are in New York. So they really are in touch with some of those important areas uh, that we need to seek out in the cotton industry. Um, like I said, the Cotton Board uh, has that fiscal responsibility of collecting assessments. Um, so you guys are probably most familiar with the producer assessment we collect. Um, there is a per bale assessment on all upland cotton that's harvested and ginned in the United States, but we also collect an assessment on the cotton content, clothing and apparel um, and textiles that are imported back into the United States that are comprised of cotton. So there's really kind of, you know, a partnership here in the cotton board in the cotton research and promotion program with producers and importers. Um, and you'll see on our board, we have producer members as well as those importer members. So individuals that work for large companies, mills and manufacturing, and they're really a nice resource for us to hear kind of what some trends are in the industry. At the Cotton Board, um, we really pride ourselves on a fantastic uh, compliance and collection rate. Um, like no other commodity in the US, uh, we continuously get over a 99% compliance rate and we're really excited about that. That's one of the things that helps us have a really strong and stable budget for Cotton Incorporated to help you guys as cotton producers really create that profitability and demand um, for your product. 2021 budget incorporated is down um, from 2020. So they will be operating this year um, at an $80 million budget. Even though we had to decrease that funding this year, um, we've been really um, proud of the fact that we've been able to stay uh, focused on a couple of key um, strategic primary issues and really address some challenges that we know are gonna be coming over this next year. Um, the top program priorities for Con Incorporated across the company in 2021 uh, include sustainability, product innovation, farm profitability, cottonseed value, and lint contamination. So we know that even with this decreased funding, we're really going to be able to still address those needs that we see on the farm um, and also in um, the industry. We this morning are talking about our state support program. So just a brief kind of overview of what this is. Galen's gonna dive into a little bit more specifics on funding levels and um, kind of how they make those decisions. But part of the producer assessment that we collect, 7.5% uh, of those assessments 
are earmarked specifically for the state support research program. Uh, these funds are then allocated to each state based on their production levels. Um, so of course, you know, more production, more cotton production in one state is going to lead to a higher funding level, less cotton production in that state is going to be a little less than the other states. Um, the funding then is determined in each state by a committee that's comprised of uh, cotton producers, um, there's some researchers, there's university staff. In Texas, we have a lot of Texas A&M AgriLife research staff that help us kind of determine where our focus needs to be on these projects, as well as carry out some of those projects. And every committee um, is managed excuse me, is managed by a Cotton Incorporated Ag Research staff member. We're really lucky here in Texas to have Dr. Galen Morgan as our uh, state support program, um, I guess, manager, if you will. Um, Dr. Morgan worked here in Texas as the uh, state cotton specialist, so we're really excited to kind of keep him um, here in the state once he left us to go to Cotton Incorporated. Um, I also wanted to just briefly mention, I'm not going to read this list of names to you, um, but on our state support committee uh, are the members of the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated Board. So they're producers and alternates that are all across the state and they really are helping you guys kind of share a voice on maybe what's important in their area for us to focus research dollars on, maybe what isn't quite important, or maybe what are some things we should think of years down the road. Um, in Texas, we have several meetings throughout the year where uh, these funds are decided for the coming year. There's some project updates for you to hear about, maybe what's been going on that past year. We'd love for you to have us or to have you join us at one of these meetings. If you've never been to a state support meeting, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to tell you when the next dates are um, for you to come and listen to these research projects. And those researchers give us an update on what their funds are being used for. I would like to recognize um, Marvin, he's on this call uh, down in Taft, Texas. He is our current chairman of the Texas State Support Program. Um, so you guys down in South Texas have a fantastic voice and leadership for Marvin. Um, kind of helping guide this committee, making sure that we're using our funds appropriately and really focusing on some problems and some key issues uh, that you guys are experiencing on the farm and how we can help there. Um, so with that, I am going to turn this presentation over to Galen Morgan. Um, my contact information is here on the screen. Um, like Stacy said, we'll be following up with you with the um, recording of this presentation. And if there's any resources Galen shares, we'll be sending those out as well. But I'd love for you to reach out to me um, and I can definitely keep you updated with state support uh, programs, projects, um, and what's going on in the state. So with that, Galen, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Christy. Let's see. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and give this this overview to something the Cotton Board had had wanted to do, and I thought it was a very good idea as well, just to kind of relay a 30,000 foot overview of kind of what the State Support Committee does and some of the projects that are being funded. And due to the, the time constraints here and the, the large amount of projects uh, that are funded through the State Support Committee, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, but if you have specific ideas feel free to contact any of the cotton board people. You can contact me or any of the other folks, the produce, list of producers there that you saw in the list that uh, Christy had and relay that information on. Um, one of the folks on the line here has already sent me a couple questions. Um, so that's good. That's what we wanted to hear. And he had a idea for a new research area. So that's the kind of feedback we're hoping to get from, from this sort of presentation. Going into this, there are also several key uh, research and extension folks on the call as well. Um, you know, so if there are any specific questions about projects that are going on, um, hopefully those folks would, if I can't answer it, those folks will be able to answer it. Um, but I think also we invited them so that they can kind of also kind of see and see the level of transparency that occurs with these state support committee funds. And then also Aaron Nelson is on the phone as well. He's with the Texas Cotton Jenners. But he also is kind of the glue that, that holds the state support committee group together and the organization part of it. Because the, the Texas Cotton, Texas State Support Committee, as you saw from Christie's list, there are a lot of producers and they're from all the different regions across Texas, which are nine different production regions. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So 
So I just wanted to go a little bit about the, the funding levels and this ties in a, with some of the things that Christy was saying, but for 2020, um, Texas has $1.27 million in their state support uh, committee uh, available to the state support committee. Now that those funds and those projects have already been selected for 2021. Um, and I just wanted to point out and that on the right there, are the, the production years, uh, production per year, and it's kind of hidden on mine, but it's planted acres, harvested acres, and then the total production. And unfortunately in Texas, we do see a, a pretty big discrepancy some years between what's planted and what's harvested due to drought and other things that occur. But fortunately with these state support committee funds, they're on an Olympic average. Uh, so that helps kind of even out um, the funding from one year to the next, which makes it a lot easier to support multi-year projects and things like that. So that was very good foresight on um, Cotton Incorporated and State Support Committee to look at that Olympic average. And the things I'm gonna talk about today are funds that are uh, and projects that were selected by the State Support Committee. Uh, that does not include funds from the core research program, uh, which are usually focused on multi-state type projects and also complement some of the projects uh, that the State Support Committee funds. So the funding breakdown for 2021, uh, total production was 7.461 bales, again, equating to $1.27 million available to the State Support Committee for um, 2021. And what's kind of unique about Texas, and it's, it's also covered up with some of the, the images here on, the, on my screen, but basically we have nine different production regions in, the, in Texas and each of those receive funding uh, based on the level of production within those regions. So on the right side, we have the, the pie chart there. So of all the funds that come into the, the Texas State Support Committee, basically 50% of those are divided into statewide type projects. So those are usually multi-region projects uh, that may cover you know, South Texas and the Black Lands or the Rolling Plains and Southern Rolling Plains, or it could have locations across the entire state. That includes also like the breeding programs um, uh, that usually comes out of the, the statewide funding. Some of the physiology work also comes out of the, the statewide funding. So kind of any projects that are gonna benefit multiple regions within the US kind of fall within that statewide category. And then the remaining 50% of those funds are divided out by production um, for each region within, within the state. So you can uh, put the numbers there in some of the larger production regions. So South Texas cotton and grain, um, Plains cotton growers, Rolling Plains, uh, those are some of the larger ones of that piece of pie, but all those individual regions do get funding coming back to them and they can allocate those funds to research in their region. They can pair up with other regions uh, to fund uh, projects. So it's very common that St. Lawrence may pair up with Southern Rolling Plains uh, to fund projects or to fund um, uh, equipment or things like that that are going on uh, that impact just those two specific regions. So the selection process for the projects, again, the S Texas State Sup Support Committee sets those priority areas for the research and outreach. Um, they do have an advisory committee, a scientific advisory committee that looks at those first and provides rankings, but ultimately it's the Texas State Support Committee that have complete discretion on which of those projects are funded. And typically it's about 70 to 85 proposals are submitted annually. Um, and in 2021, 60 of those were, were funded. The projects, the budget for the state support committee is an annual budget. So each of these projects are only funded on an annual basis, but the state support committee recognizes the need for some multi-year projects and then prioritizes those multi-year projects for the following year. Uh, but again, funding is only on an annual basis. And then this ties in with, with what Christy was mentioning, is after these projects are selected, 
basically they, the, they're assigned to a cotton incorporated project manager. And that's, I'll show you a picture in a little bit that's broken out by discipline. And then each of the scientists have to submit quarterly and annual reports for each of the projects that are funded. So this is kind of the overview part of it. So as a project manager, I look at the quarterly reports, I approve the quarterly reports and the same for the money as it's being spent um, by each of those, for each of those projects. And then also at, in December, usually the first week in December, uh, there are presentations that are given by these, the PIs of these projects uh, to the Texas State Support Committee and anyone else that wants to attend that open meeting. And that's usually in Lubbock the first week of December. And something I just wanted to point out is, you know, there's a lot of leveraging of funds uh, that go on with this, and it brings a lot of value to the growers. Uh, one of the first things is on these state support committee funds, there's no overhead paid to the universities or USDA or whoever is, uh, you know, funded with these projects. And, you know, that's not what the universities wants, want to hear, uh, but it's really good for the scientists that are implementing those projects. Um, because some of the larger grants that they apply for may be 25 to 45 or even 50% overhead. So since there's no overhead, this money, the grower's money goes a lot further uh, since that overhead's not taken out. The other thing is this, the funding uh, keeps preeminent scientists uh, with universities and USDA engaged in cutting edge research in cotton. It keeps cotton on their radar, uh, which is very good. And many cases, the funding that's provided by the state support committee is, um, is seed money for them to pursue larger federal grants. So in many cases with these larger federal grants, uh, if you can show some preliminary research, it increases your chances of getting funded through these federal um, funds. So that's Cotton Incorporated money or the state support committee money goes a long way in that regards too. The other thing is there are numerous projects that are funded in particular by some of the, for some of the extension specialists that have kind of a broad, um, a broad project that says to address emerging issues for, for growers across the state. And in many cases, a lot of those state support committee funds are used to keep even company trials balanced. So those individuals are getting also funding from, you know, the Bears and the BAS and other places. But with funds from the state support committee, this allows them to add a treatment or two in there or even more to keep some of those even company trials more balanced. Um, and again, that's leveraging you know, the growers funds. And another important point is they're training the next generation of farmers, leaders, consultants, county agents, and researchers with knowledge of cotton and the desire to serve the cotton industry. So that's another very important one for the future of of the cotton industry is to train the next generation. And then, you know, also just trying to put some actual numbers with, with leveraging of funds. The number that the Ag and Food Policy from Texas A&M had, they get funded for about 12,500 generally each year um, to do numerous things. And it's at the very end of my slide presentation, some of the examples. But based on their calculations, they figure that it's a, for every dollar invested in the Food and Policy Center by the State Support Committee, they get $142 back. So that's a really good return on investment. Um, looking at most of the other ag research, and I didn't have any hard numbers to go with this, but just based off my experience, it's at a minimum for every dollar invested in some of these research projects, they're at least getting $10 back in many ways from the leveraging that I, that I mentioned above. So this is, I have two slides here that just list the, the vast number of projects that are funded by the this Texas State Support Committee. And it goes from cotton improvement through physiology to pest management to economics. And we'll touch on some of those specifically, but I, I just kind of wanted you to see the vastness of this here, uh, of these different projects that are funded. Sorry about that. My mouse is a little touchy. Um, and about the middle of the page there, you can see that the one of the columns on the left ends, and then it starts with the 21A through 21P on your screen. Those were new proposals that were submitted. So generally there's anywhere from 15 to 30 new proposals submitted every year. 
to the state support committee for their consideration. So a lot of new ideas are coming into, into it as well. And this is the uh, Cotton Incorporated Ag and Environmental uh, staff in the Ag and Research Division. So once the projects are selected by the state support committee, they're assigned to one of these individuals. And again, it's kind of by, by discipline, um, like Cater Hake, who is the, the VP and, and my immediate supervisor, he has uh, diseases and also some physiology. I generally, if they're weeds, nutrients, or soil health, they're usually assigned to me. If they're in the breeding area, they're assigned to, to Don Jones there in the bottom center. Entomology, cotton seed, et cetera. And if you have specific interest in more details, um, there is a, a web page out there the cotton, at Cotton Incorporated. You can see the link there. Uh, and it would describes all the projects that are funded um, for that and, and how the state support committee funding occurs and some of it Christy color, covered earlier and I touched on as well. And then if you're just looking for general information on, on cotton management, there's a cotton cultivated webpage uh, that you can see there. And if you have any questions or concerns about any of this, um, be sure and give me a, send me an email, which is below or, or drop a note in the chat. So we're gonna get into some of the kind of overarching of some of the major projects that are funded to the Texas State Support Committee. And, you know, it covers the entire state to some degree, but I'm gonna focus a bit more on some of the, the South Texas uh, Blacklands sort of projects. But moving into the, the breeding portion of it, you know, fiber quality is key to maintaining U.S. demand. I know that the growers obviously get paid primarily on pounds but we also have to have a market for our, our cotton and, and quality is, is one of the main ways that we can maintain that market. And obviously over the last 20 years, we've gone to a predominantly export market with about 85% of our cotton being exported. And with the cotton being exported and then also some new um, spinning technology coming on, there's, there's reasons to breed for certain character fiber quality characteristics in our cotton. And that's kind of what one of the major focuses is for the breeding program uh, for South and East Texas, which is Wayne Smith, Steve Haig, and Dave Stelly. Wayne Smith specifically focuses on extra long staple. And you can see there in the graph, some of the improvements that have been made over time uh, for, for staple length. And Dave Stelly is a, does a lot of work kind of on the molecular level and in integrating uh, traits from from wild biotypes into cotton uh, for disease resistance, nematode resistance and things like that. So he's kind of the molecular component of that breeding team. And then Steve Haig is kind of a jack of all traits and he actually, they release some varieties and then he focuses on specific characteristics that will increase the bottom line of the growers as well. And then we have our, generally speaking, like our cotton physiology team. Um, you know, they're, they're located at multiple locations uh, across the state and they work together as a team and they're funded as currently funded as a team, but utilizing the latest technology to understand crop growth and improve efficiencies, including irrigation, nutrient management and pest management. And that, uh, you know, UAVs are obviously a big part of that, not only from a research perspective, but finding ways that, that the UAVs could be used to improve you know, crop management and even, you know, scouting and things like that. And that, that center picture there just shows some difference in irrigation and difference in temperature in those plants under different irrigation regimes. Another effort that is really big uh, throughout the state, uh, but also in, in South and East Texas is the on-farm variety trials. And I think Ben McKnight, who's now the extension cotton specialist in College Station and, and Josh McGinney are on here and they run anywhere from 18 to 22 race trials annually. And these are on-farm replicated trials that are managed by the growers. Um, and then they put out a, a really nice publication each year on these variety results. Uh, and they can be found at, at cotton.tamu.edu. There's also a lot of emphasis on nutrient management you know, over the past five or six years, there's been funding from the state support committee to, to look at particular uh, potassium management in cotton. The pictures on the left and the right there show some of the 
potassium deficiencies in the Black Lands and the, the upper Gulf Coast region. Um, and then the center graph shows the estimated uptake for the different nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and, you know, some of the research funded recently by the State Support Committee uh, for the High Plains actually has reworked this uh, nutrient management accumulation. Uh, Dr. Katie Lewis did that and recently published it, but it was funded by the State Support Committee as well and obviously influences the entire state. And also from the potassium project that was funded, the uh, potassium recommendations by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension was actually modified uh, to a based on the research supported by the Texas State Support Committee. So that was a big accomplishment as well. Uh, harvest aids and, and post-harvest stalk destruction, a big deal obviously for South Texas, you know, trying to get that crop and maintain that fiber quality and get that crop out before, you know, hurricane season hits. There are very few new products and harvest aids, but still we all know that the, looking at these harvest aids and some of the demos that, that people like Josh and Ben are doing, uh, and also Danielle down in the Rio Grande Valley are really helped the grower make some of these management decisions on which harvest aids seem to be doing the best on any of those given years. So, you know, they do these um, every year and, and they also, these are really good educational events. And then also uh, post-harvest stalk destruction, state support committee has been actively involved in, in funding some projects um, on this, especially as the dicamba resistant and the 2,4-D um, tolerant cottons have come out. That's really changed the way harvest um, stalk destruction has had to happen. And Josh has been very involved with that and, and Ben is as well in, in identifying new products uh, for that. Insect management, I think David Kearns is on the, the call as well and he's the, um, he's the insect, uh, he's the extension entomologist um, with statewide responsibilities and also works with the, the IPM agents, a supervisor of those. But a lot of the funds, um, the, the IPM agents are, are funded through this to address local needs, uh, whether it's uh, some of the individual pests that occur in the upper Gulf Coast or that mid coast region such as Stephen Biles, uh, but also new product evaluation. Um, I know David Kearns and a lot of the IPM agents look at new products as they, they come are available to the growers or before they're available and they get a, it's an unbiased evaluation of how the insecticides, uh, biologicals and the traits that are coming on board, um, how they work and how they function in, in South and East Texas. And then of course, there's a huge educational outreach component to their programs as well. And this is some of the work that David Kearns has been doing over the years, just looking at the how the BT traits are holding up in Texas. I'm not going to get into a lot of details. If you have specific questions, David can can address those. Um, but you know, basically, a lot of our Bogard one and Bogard two technologies don't have a lot of value. That's shown in those uh, red indicates there's resistance out there. But luckily, the VIP three A trait, which is in our Bogard three and our Wide Strike three. Uh, have do continue to have um, efficacy for managing uh, bollworms. And again, a lot of the, the work's going on is focusing on this because the growers invest so much in that technology as far as seed uh, goes. But luckily, the, the VIP traits are still holding up, um, and that, you know, is, is good. There's some, some exceptions, and, and David can address those if there are specific uh, questions. Again, just wanted to show some, they're doing efficacy trials as well, uh, looking at some of the new products that are coming uh, into the market. Another big area is weed management and, and managing herbicide resistant weeds. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but suffice it to say, we continue to have more and more herbicide resistant weeds. And in many cases, it's weeds that are, have resistance to multiple modes of action. Um, dicamba resistant weeds were identified in the the Mid-South this year, um, and many of those weeds are also resistant to one, two, or three other modes of action. So it really narrows down the herbicide options. Um, so some of the work that's being funded by, this, funded by the State Support Committee is not only looking at, you know, management of weeds with herbicides, but also looking at 
the biology of these major weeds, major weed species, and figuring out uh, kind of the weak link uh, within their biology and taking advantage of that. So looking at seed, seed longevity, uh, looking at post-harvest management options, and cover crops for suppressing weeds, weeds as well. And the picture there on your right is just showing some of the, the work that happens to be the Lubbock location, but it's being done in South Texas as well. Looking at the longevity of these seeds when they're uh, of Palmer amaranth in this situation, how long they last. If we know the seeds are only gonna last a year or two, that obviously changes the management strategy versus if those seeds will go on for five or 10 years. And then some of the post-harvest management, that's a picture of a Palmer amaranth uh, spikelet, and it shows the development of the seeds within that spikelet. So if we can target even some late season or post-harvest management of herbicides, they can actually get really good control of those immature seeds, which will prevent them from obviously being viable the following year. And then cover crops, there's a lot more work on that and its impact on, on weed management. Herbicide efficacy trials are still a big part of that. Uh, this is not gonna go any detail on the specifics here. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Or, or like I say, Josh is on the line uh, as well. And, and Scott Nolte may be as well, who is the extension uh, weed specialist. But just suffice it to say, looking at you know, the problematic weeds uh, throughout the region, you know, Palmer amaranth, and then down in South Texas, the Parthenium ragweed. And then they're also looking at, and this is funded through the state support committee, looking at new traits as they come on board, such as the BASF, uh, Isex Aflutol uh, product, which is GLT IP, mine's kind of covered up there, but looking at that, the level of efficacy and, and where it's actually gonna fit within the grower program. And again, a lot of cases, um, these are projects that, that may be at multiple places across the entire cotton belt but the funding from the state support committee funds the locations only with, within Texas and allows them to Texas to participate in those sorts of beltwide type projects as well. Also looking at UAVs and, and weed management options, whether that's spot spraying or weed identification or other things, but a lot of work's going on by Dr. Muthu at, at College Station that's funded through state support committee as well. And then another big area, of course, is disease management, um, identifying and developing management strategies for um, diseases across the state of Texas. Um, this is Fusarium race four, which is not in South Texas. Uh, this is out in El Paso, but it has the potential to move to other parts of the state. Um, and in South Texas, Dr. Tom Isaacy, the extension pathologist, does a really good job getting out of the invisible answering questions for identification, but also identifying management strategies. Um, and he's been working with various people across the state, including Ben on uh, reniform nematodes uh, in that South and, and East Texas as well. And then again, just focusing on even some of the, the diseases that have been out there a while, uh, bacterial blight, for example, and still trying to, you know, identify management strategies that are, are feasible for that. Uh, bacterial blight is a bacteria, but there always seems to come the rumor out that you can control it with a fungicide. So I know that Tom's constantly battling things like that, misinformation, and trying to get accurate, unbiased information out to the growers. So the other thing that, you know, this isn't directly uh, supported by the Texas State Support Committee, but the research that the state, Texas State Support Committee funds allows uh, the scientists to contribute to, you know, providing data and other things to support uh, section 24 C's or section 18's for pesticides working with TDA. Um, based on the, the funding and the research that they do, they're able to provide unbiased information which allows um, that to proceed and move forward. And one example, more recent example is modifications to the dicamba label. Um, that have occurred, that's due to some of the research that was uh, supported through the Texas State Support Committee. Top guard for cotton root rot in Texas. Again, State Support Committee funded Tom Isaac Heat literally over a decade ago doing research on top guard. Based on that data, um, a section 18 
um, was able to get for that product. And then also Duplisan for, for cotton stalk destruction in Texas is the exact same way. Uh, State Support Committee funded stalk destruction trials, and then that data fed back into TDA and allowed Duplisan to get labeled to control um, both enlist cotton and dicamba tolerant uh, cotton stalks. And then, of, of course, the development and implement of required trainings, for example, with the dicamba trainings um, and the oxen trainings in Texas, that's funding from the State Support Committee has also gone to help implement that and make sure those trainings are, are viable uh, throughout the state. And this just shows you the number of people that have been trained. And again, um, for the oxen trainings, it just shows that, you know, the the money invested by the state support committee is going a long way to address some of the key issues uh, for the growers and the needs of the growers. There's also a decent amount of things that are of molecular uh, type work that's funded as needed through the state support committee. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail on this slide because I couldn't explain it even if I tried. But again, just, you know, as appropriate and as the state support committee thinks it's a priority, this is on bacterial blight in cotton, but identifying some of the molecular and genetic uh, factors that will allow the development of, um, of resistance uh, to pests like bacterial blight, again, nematodes and things like that. Kind of on the ginning side of things, plastic contamination is, is really big. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on uh, from various people, primarily at, at, at Texas A&M um, Biological Engineering, uh, Ag and Biological Engineering, um, looking at, you know, plastic contamination and ways to, you know, remove the plastic from the gin and prevent the plastic from, from ever getting into the gin. Bobby Harden may be on the call. I can't see all the people, but this is an area that Bobby Harden uh, at Texas A&M is working on. Uh, pretty substantially and is funded by the state support committee. And then, you know, looking at, you know, fairly simple things, uh, we know that these tears in the, the module wraps typically lead to plastic getting into the gin. So just, you know, looking at ways to identify where these tears may be happening, you know, under what situations and how they can prevent that from actually getting into the gin. This happens to be a core funded project, but again, it ties in and complements a lot of the state support committee uh, work that's being done. And it was a cool picture, so I decided to add it. Uh, this is a ag and, and food policy, some of the things that they're doing. Um, I actually meant to hide that slide because I have another one here that, that kind of 